Let me start this session with a puzzle. Over the last 30 years, our access to data has improved dramatically. 30 years ago, the value company I needed to go find an annual report, probably physically, perhaps email, uh, forget about email, write to the company to give me more information. But I was stuck with very limited data. Today, I can download the data in seconds for thousands of companies. We also have much better models at our disposal. I don't need a mainframe to run a Monte Carlo simulation. I can run it from my PC. So we have more data and better models. Our valuations should be getting better, right? But they aren't. So let's think about the biggest enemy in valuation. It's not that people don't know valuation, that they can't build models, that they don't have the tools, they don't have the data. It's bias. And let me explain what I mean by this. When you sit down to value a company, bias shows up in so many different places. When you value a company, you almost never valued with a clean slate. You bring in your preconceptions, your priors about the company, what you already know about the company into your valuation, and it will affect your valuation. In fact, some of the things you're asked to do in valuation often cut in the direction of more bias. You're asked to find out more about the company, read up what other people have said about the company. As you read those things, it is going to affect your preconceptions, your priors about the company. You're asked to find out more about the management, hang out with them, learn more about them. And God help you, if you start to like the managers of a company, it is going to affect your valuation. And in many valuations, the truth is the value gets set first, the valuation follows. People decide what they want something to be worth and they try to figure out a way to get to that number. And if you think about the sources of bias, they're both subtle and direct. There are, there's the power of the subconscious, which is if everybody else loves a stock, it's very difficult for you to not love the stock too. The second is we act as if we knew things we never did. It's called hindsight bias, where once we've seen the outcome, we think we knew that was gonna happen right from the beginning. There is also the power of suggestion. I've seen people throw a number into a conversation without even thinking about it. And then that number finds its way into evaluation. When you value a company, especially if it's a publicly traded company, this actually shows up in a very obvious way. You value a company, and if it's publicly traded, what's the first number you check? The stock price, right? Whether you like it or not, that stock price will affect your valuation. And finally, there's the power of money. I've told people that once you get paid to do a valuation, all is lost in a sense, because that is going to affect your valuation. No matter how good you are as a person, how honest you are, that money is going to bias the process. I've told people, you tell me who pays you to do a valuation, how much you get paid. I'll tell you which direction the bias is and how much the bias is. And as you add more bias to the process, the less point there is to actually thinking about the inputs into valuation. Now, very quickly though, let me give you some tricks. And these are not tricks that are hidden tricks. We all know it if we've done valuation for a long time. You're doing an intrinsic valuation or a discounted cash flow value for a company. If you want to increase the value of your company, because that's where your bias leads you, we know you, what you need to do. You take the existing earnings and cash flows and you try to find ways to make them bigger. By doing what? By removing expenses that are really operating expenses and you call them extraordinary or one-time expenses. By counting income that is one-time income, but you act like it's an ongoing income. Using a low effective tax rate because we were able to pay less in taxes last year. To increase the value of growth, you push up the growth rate in your revenues, you push up your operating margin. That's gonna give you a higher income in the future. And you com and as a companion, you make sure you can do all of this without reinvesting very much. Low CapEx, low change in working capital. When you think about the discount rate and you think about the inputs, you want to make the discount rate as low as possible if you want to make the value higher. How can you do it? You can replace today's risk-free rate with what you call a normalized rate a rate much lower than today. That's tough to do in today's interest rate environment, but in, when interest rates were five or 6%, people did this. You can try to act like your stock is a very low risk stock relative to other stocks. If you're talking about betas, you try to give it a low beta. You try to use the lowest equity risk premium you can, and you play tricks. You take a US company that gets 80% of its revenues from Brazil, but you treat it as a US company and give it the equity risk premium for a US company. And even within the US, your biases lead you towards lower numbers. And finally, if you're introducing debt, you add debt into the process without any of its side effects. You increase the debt ratio without affecting the beta or the cost of debt. 
you lower the discount rate. Finally, in the terminal value, there are all games you can play that can make that number a huge number. You can use a growth rate that's too high, a growth rate much higher than the growth rate of the economy. Mathematically impossible, but it pushes up your value. You play that little game that some analysts play, which is it's a mature company, doesn't have to reinvest any money. No reinvestment, but growth. But these are all tricks we play in intrinsic valuation. In pricing, where you try to put a number on a company based on how similar companies are priced out there, you get to pick what companies are similar and you get to pick what you scale the price to, earnings, book value, revenues. Hey, I've given you choices that you can use to come up with whatever number you want because you will pick a peer group that reflects your biases and you will find a pricing metric that works for you. So when you tell me to use those seven companies in EV to EBITDA, the question I should really be asking is, what did you start with before you came up with seven? And what are the pricing multiples did you try before you tried EV to EBITDA? So bias is part of the game. You're probably sitting there saying, right, I'm not biased. Let's play a few what if questions. Let's say you're valuing your own business and you take the role of the owner of the business. If you're valuing your own business for sale to a third person, do you want the number you come back with to be a high number, a low number, or not, or you're not quite clear? Pick one. I mean, I'll give you my answers at the end, but pick based on the, the, stru the, uh, the structure I put on you. You're valuing your own business. What's your bias? You're a venture capitalist investing in the same business do you want to attach a high value to the business, a low value or unclear? And remember, the venture capitalist value will determine how much of your business he's going to ask for you. Because if he puts a high value, he'll ask for a lower percentage. If he puts a low value, he'll ask for a higher percentage. So think about it. High, low, or you're not clear. Let's make it personal. You get married. You get divorced. You own a business jointly. You're valuing your business because half that value has to go to your soon-to-be ex-spouse. Do you want the number to be a high number, a low number, or you're not quite clear? Be honest. If you're an appraiser for the owner, valuing a business for tax purposes, remember the value is going to come back and the tax guy is going to take away 30% of the value. Do you want the number to be a high number, a low number, you're not quite clear. But if you're an appraiser for the IRS looking at that same business, you're attaching a value. It's the same company being valued from the other side. Would your bias be high, low, or unclear? Now do you see why courts get so much work in valuation and why you have expert witnesses on both sides? Let's talk about equity research. You're a sell-side equity research analyst. So these are the equity research analysts we read about. Work at investment banks, valuing a company with the intent of putting a buy or a sell recommendation. Is your bias to come back with a high number, a low number, or you're not quite clear? Think through the consequences. If you come up with a high number and you put out a buy recommendation, everybody likes you, including the company. And remember, your access to information comes from whom? The company. So think through it. Okay? If you're a buy side analyst, in other words, you work for Fidelity or Janus, and your portfolio manager is asking you to value a company, and he tells you, oh, by the way, I own a million shares of the company. Do you think there might be some bias in your valuation? Are you going to come up with a high value, a low value, or you're not quite clear? You know, similarly, if you're a buy side analyst valuing a company and your portfolio manager says, I hate the company, I've sold short a million shares of the company. What do you think your bias is going to be? What do you think will make him happy? Because remember, if he's happy, you're going to be happy too. Now let's look at the most biased process of all. Let's talk about M&A. You're an M&A analyst. It's a friendly merger. So you've got an acquiring firm and a target firm. You're an M&A analyst working for the banker of the acquirer uh, um, in the in a friendly takeover. Do you want this deal to go through? Think through the consequences. And therefore, do you want the value to be a high number, a low number, or an unclear number? Remember, you want to come up with a number that can justify the deal going through. Now you're the M&A analyst working for the target company. And you want the deal to go through too. Remember that you want the deal to go through no matter which side of the transaction you're going to. Now do you want the value to be a high number, a low number or you're not quite clear. This is one of the trickiest games to play in, 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 in valuation because both sides have to merge thinking they want. So the acquiring company and stockholders have to be convinced um, that they're getting a good deal, that they're actually buying a company that's worth a lot more than they're paying for it. At the same time, the target company shareholders have to be convinced that they're actually getting a great deal, which means that the price they're getting is higher than the value. You say, how the hell do they pull this off? They do it all the time because these deals go through. And that's where magical words like synergy 
and control can come in because they fill in the gap. Finally, let's talk about a hostile takeover. In a hostile takeover, the acquiring company wants a deal to go through, the target company does not. You're the banker for the acquiring company. Your game gets a little trickier, right? Because if you come up with a really high value for the target company, well, the target company is going to use that as ammunition to stop the deal. So you might actually reverse what you had with the friendly takeover process. But let's face it, it's biased still because you still have a bias in getting the deal through. So the bottom line is that when you do valuation, acting as if your objective is delusion. The bottom line on bias is it's unavoidable. You know why you have it? Because you're a human being. You're saying, what if I buy, build a machine, um, a computer to do it for me? Who built the machine? Your biases will find their way into your machines. There is no way you can avoid it. So what can we do about it? Let's stop being in denial. I'm tired of certification groups like the NACWI, ASA, CFA, all claiming to be objective. Let's accept the fact that bias is part of the game. And then let's be transparent. When you do a valuation, let's practice some Bayesian valuation. Bayesian statistics, you t state your priors first and then you tell me what your results are. Bayesian valuation, you tell me what your biases are before you show me a valuation. And finally, let's stop lying to ourselves. The person you gotta be honest with, especially if your investments are based on evaluation, is yourself. So be honest with yourself about your biases. The bottom line is bias is part of being human. It's not a bad thing, it's not a good thing. It becomes a problem when we act like it's not there because then we have problematic valuations. In session one, I described this class as a valuation class. And I said, we're gonna value just about everything from publicly traded stocks to private companies, from standalone assets to businesses, even Bitcoin and Kim Kardashian. So that's quite a mission. And we'll be covering a lot of stuff in this class. And along the way, it's going to be easy to get confused as to where exactly we are in this class. So what I thought I'd do in this session is set the table for the class give you a framework for thinking about everything that's going to come after it and a way of organizing it. So let me go back to a very to a, to a starting point for this class. When I first started teaching valuation, I made the mistake of assuming that everybody else was as interested in valuation as I was. Big mistake. Because I've discovered in hindsight that most people don't believe in valuation. By most people, I include most people who value companies for a living, equity research analysts, portfolio managers, don't really believe in valuation. But you think, but they do it all the time. They do it because it's their job. They do it to cover the rear ends. But if you caught them in an honest moment and ask them, why is Tesla trading at $300 per share? Their honest answer is going to be because that's what the market thinks it's worth. If you scratch the surface, most people think this is a waste of time, that there is no point trying to value companies because there's too much uncertainty. You can't model what's going to happen in the future. Now, if I believed that about valuation, I wouldn't be teaching this class. So I'm going to start off by giving you why I do valuation in the first place and why I teach this class. I do valuation to fight the lemming in me. You've heard of lemmings, right? They became famous or infamous in the 1950s when National Geographic filmed the most amazing site. In fact, Disney made a movie out of it, and there's actually a rumor that, that lemmings don't actually do what these movies suggest they do, but let's stick with the fiction. So here's what you saw. You saw thousands of ugly, big rat-like creatures. That's what lemmings look like, so don't glamorize them. Collected together on a cliff, ran right off the cliff into an ocean to commit collective suicide. And ever since, one of those big questions has been, why did they do it? What drives them off the cliff? I don't know the answer to that question, but let's do some virtual imagery. You can see why the first lemming did it, right? He was going too fast. He couldn't stop. You all go off the cliff into the ocean. And since lemmings can't swim, it kind of seals the deal. Dead, right? Second lemming, too close to the first guy, couldn't stop either, goes in the ocean and dies. But I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of the very last lemming in that group. I know lemmings don't wear shoes, but I hang in there with the analogy anyway. You're running as fast as you can towards a cliff. You've seen your entire tribe disappear off that cliff. I would think you'd have second thoughts about what you were just planning to do. Your left brain, right brain, whatever part of you is rational saying, stop, stop, don't do it. 
But then there's a voice in the back of your head. You know what it's saying? They must know something that you don't. Remember those seven words. They're the seven most deadly words in investing. They must know something that you don't. You'll hear it all the time. I do. I'll tell you when I hear it. I've sat down to value Tesla multiple times. Let's say I do it again. I sit down and value Tesla using an intrinsic valuation model, bringing all the tools and techniques I know, and I come up with a value of $160 per share. Stock's trading at 300, right? My rational side is telling me, don't buy the stock, it's overvalued. But then I hear this voice in the back of my head. They must know something that you don't. It speaks in a monotone, don't ask me why. When I hear that voice, magical things start to happen to my valuation. Cash flows start to go up, my growth becomes higher, my discount rates become low, 160 becomes 180, becomes 200, becomes 220, and before you know it, you're at 300. Don't fight it, there's a lemming inside each and every one of you dying to get out, let it out. In fact, I divide the whole world of investors into three groups of lemmings. The first group, I call proud lemmings. I'm proud to be a lemming, and I'll tell everybody that I'm a lemming. You're saying, why would you want to do that? that? That's what momentum investors do. They look for a crowd and they join in. I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. The second group of lemmings, I call Yogi Bear lemmings. Remember Yogi Bear, cartoon character? There's actually a movie that was made around Yogi Bear. I, I remember going to see it. My kids refused to come with me because I used to love Yogi Bear comics when I was a kid. And Yogi Bear's most famous saying was he was smarter than the average bear. Yogi Bear lemmings think they're smarter than the average lemming. Here's what they want to do. They want to run with the crowd to the very edge of the cliff and at the last moment veer away. Great if you can pull it off, right? You get all the upside of momentum and none of the downside. Think about it, you're tempted. You're saying, I'm smarter than the average investor. I know where the cliff is coming. Maybe you do, but I've never been able to tell. After the fact, everybody knows there was a cliff behind you. Notice before the fact, nobody seems to know. So when you had the 2008 correction, there were these experts who came and said, I saw it coming. Hey, how come you never mentioned it? You were on CNBC every day for the last two years. I don't know where the cliff is coming. I am not smarter than the average lemming. I'm not a proud lemming. In fact, if you ask me to describe myself, I describe myself as a lemming with a life vest. See that second to last guy on that in the picture, the guy with the, that's what I am. I can't fight the fact that I'm a human being. I'm gonna get caught up in the mood of the moment when everybody else is optimistic, I'm gonna be optimistic too. All that valuation does for me, it throws me a life first. It says, even if everybody else changes their mind, you have something to hold on to. These cash flows, these growth rates. I do valuation to slow the process down, to give my rational side a chance to mount an argument. And you know what, nine times out of 10, I will ignore what it tells me and do what I wanted to do in the first place. But maybe that one time out of 10, you'll listen to it, it'll save me money. So my objectives in this class are not to make you rational supercomputers. I cannot, you're human beings. It's to give you the tools and techniques so that you have a life vest, something to hold on to. So you're investing for something more than everybody else likes the stock I'm investing in. So don't expect too much from this class in terms of making you rational. I'm not gonna be able to, but maybe, maybe, You'll slow the process down so you will do some sensible things. With that said, let me, let me list out some misconceptions about valuation. These are misconceptions that are widely held, not just among people who don't know much about valuation, but among people who do valuation for a living, who should know better. Here's the first one. If I do a good valuation, I get a scientific estimate of value, that somehow valuations are objective searches for truth. You know what feeds into this? You sit in front of computers, you feed numbers into models, and after a while you convince yourself that because you're using numbers, you can't be biased. Well, that's a lie. Here's the first truth. All valuations are biased. Why? Because when you sit down to value a company, all your preconceptions about the company go into your, come into the valuation with you. I'll make this personal. I have valued Microsoft every year since 1986. That was the year of the initial public offering and I valued it every year. For most of Microsoft's life, I found it to be overvalued. You name the price, I found it overvalued at that price, $2, $4, $7, $8, $9, $10, $11, $12, $13, $14, $15, $16, $17, $18, $19, $20, $21, $22, $23, $24, $25, $26, $27, $28, $29, $30, $
six dollars, ten dollars. Strange, right? One of the great success stories of equity markets of the last 50 years, I wouldn't have touched it one step the way. You think, why? I could give you access to every single Microsoft valuation I've done. And you could dig through the numbers looking for clues as to why I found it overvalued, but you'd be looking in the wrong place. If you really want to know why I found Microsoft to be overvalued, all you need to do is take a trek up, trek up to the ninth floor of the business school building into my office. I leave it open. You can walk in and steal whatever you want and look around. You know what you're going to see? You're going to see a lot of computers with pictures of fruit on their back. I've been an Apple user since 1981. In fact, in my office, I have the Mac 128K, my very first Apple. It was a Macintosh which came without a hard drive and I've always loved Apple. And to me, Microsoft has always been the Darth Vader of technology. For those of your Star Wars fans, let me be specific. I'm not talking, you know, Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader, episodes one, two, three. I'm talking Darth Darth Vader, the guy who always dresses in black, who never seems to take a shower, talks in a strange voice. I have lots of bad thoughts about Bill Gates. And every time I sit down to value Microsoft, those bad thoughts come bubbling up to the surface. Because here's what you face in valuation. You constantly come to forks in the road. High growth or low growth, high risk or low risk. With Microsoft, my cho choices are in a sense predestined because of my bias. High growth or low growth, low growth. Who picked this rotten product? High risk or low risk, one virus away from blowing up, high risk. And by the time I make my choices, guess what? The end game is already pre-designed pre to give me the answer, which is, hey, Microsoft's not worth much. You know what that tells me? I'm far too biased to value Microsoft. You know what else it should tell you? If I'm far too biased to value Microsoft because I don't like the company, well, guess what? I'm probably far too biased to value Apple because I love the company. Well, I've been valuing Apple on my blog for the last seven years. And if you go back and look at my very first valuation of Apple on my blog in 2011, I've been valuing Apple for a lot longer than that, but these are public valuations. You go back and look at my first valuation in 2011. I spent half the post telling people not to trust me. I tell them, look, I love this company too much. So when I give you my numbers, that love is going to affect my numbers and my valuation. So take it with a grain of salt. What I'm trying to say is you cannot make bias go away. It is part of valuation. All you can do is be transparent about your biases. The next time you see an equity research analyst put a buy recommendation on a stock, wouldn't it be nice if on the top of the report he said, you know what, I love the company and its management so much. I should tell you that before I give you my recommendation. It'll make his recommendation much more useful. In fact, in statistics, there's a branch of statistics called Bayesian statistics. You know what you're supposed to do in Bayesian statistics? You're supposed to state your priors before you give me your results. You're supposed to say, this is what I expect to find in my study and then show me the results of your study. Because then when I look at your results, I can look at it in conjunction with your priors to decide how much I trust your analysis. I am a great fan of being open about biases and I will try to be as open about my biases as I go through this class and I value companies because that's something you need to know as somebody using my valuations. The follow up on that notion of bias is you tell me who pays you to do evaluation and how much you get paid. I'll tell you which direction the bias is and how much the bias is. Let me tell you a story to back this up. It's a company called Lynn Cable. About 30 years ago, AT&T had an option to buy 49% of Lynn Cable at an appraised value. Now, Lynn Cable was a publicly traded stock, but AT&T had this option to buy the 49% at an appraised value. So time for the option to be exercised comes about. AT&T goes out and hires Morgan Stanley to do the valuation so that they can buy Lynn Cable. So you guys to the left, be Morgan Stanley. You're going to be helping AT&T appraise the value of Lynn Cable so they can buy it. So you work for the buyer. Lynn Cable went out and hired Lehman Brothers. And I'm sorry to do this to you guys on my right, but you be Lehman Brothers pre-2008, pre-bankrupt Lehman Brothers. And your job is to appraise the value of Lynn Cable so they can sell it. 
So Morgan Stanley works for the buyer. Lehman Brothers works for the seller. Two investment banking teams go to work, come back with two very different valuations. One team comes back with $105 per share. The other comes back with $155 per share. Now, who do you think came back with $105 per share? Hey, that was an easy guess, right? It was Morgan Stanley. Why? Because they worked for the buyer. Their job is to come in with a low number and they did their job. And Lehman Brothers came back with a high number because they worked for the seller. Their job is to come with a high number. You could have called this. But if you looked at each valuation standing alone, it would look like an objective valuation. Lots of assumptions, spreadsheets, scenarios. In fact, the difference between the two valuations was so large, they decided to call in a third investment banker. Why settle for two fees when you can have three, I guess? And they call in Wasserstein Perella. Now, I'm going to say something incredibly harsh about these guys, but I mean every word of it. These guys could not value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put it in front of them. They were a boutique investment bank. What's a boutique investment bank? It's a little bit like a gastropub. Have you ever seen these at airports, gastropubs? Don't go into them. They're basically burger joints that triple the prices of everything and give themselves this fancy name. Wasserstein Perella was a boutique investment bank, but it's, in, it's squeezed in the middle here, right? It doesn't want to piss off either Morgan Stanley or Lehman Brothers too much because it might need to work with them in the future. So 105, 155, where do you think the safest place for Wasserstein Perella to go would be? Right down the middle, right? 130. They came back with $127.50. I'm going to let you in on a little secret in valuation and don't let it out of this room. If you're ever asked to value something, never come back with a nice round number. Don't tell me it's worth $40 per share. Tell me it's worth $38.83 per share. It's amazing how that second decimal will create the illusion that you know something that you actually don't. People step back. They'd be scared to ask you questions. This guy's got the second decimal nailed down. He must really know his stuff. Valuations, unfortunately, are contaminated with bias. We have to be honest about that bias. We can't run away from it. In fact, the more biased evaluation process is, the less point there is to doing valuation. And let me give you my, exa my example of the most biased process ever. Think of a merger, a friendly merger. There's an acquiring firm, there's a target firm, there's the acquiring firm's investment banker, there's the target firm's investment banker. Think about being the investment banker and I'm the acquiring firm and I come to, come to you and ask you a question. Should I buy that target firm at X dollars, the target at the price? You have two choices. Think about the answers you can give me. You can either tell me yes or no. Yes, buy the company, it's a good value. No, don't buy the company, you're paying too much. Now think through the consequences. As a banker, if you say no, what do you get? You get the eternal gratitude of my shareholders, but try play, paying your bonuses with that. Or you can say yes, in which case you make 100 million. Do you think you might be a little biased to say yes here? Asking an investment banker whether an acquisition makes sense is like asking a plastic surgeon whether there's something wrong with your face. What do you think the answer is going to be? You're already perfect. He's probably going to say your nose looks too big, your cheeks look too fat. Your job as a plastic surgeon rests on finding things that are wrong with me. Your job as a banker rests on getting deals done. It's not because bankers are bad people. It is the acquiring company's manager's job to decide whether a deal makes sense, not the banker. You know? So that's something to remember about bias. When bias enters the process, it's going to skew valuations. Let's move on to the second misconception. If I do a good valuation, I'm going to get the right answer. That precision is the way you measure the quality of evaluation. You know when this process gets started, right? When you're about five, you go off to pre-K or to kindergarten. The teacher comes up and puts a sheet of paper in front of you, three plus two, and asks you what the answer is. If you get five, you're congratulated. Good job, you got the right answer. If you get any other answer, you're told you got the wrong answer. You must have done something wrong. That lesson gets carried through all the way through school, right? And God help you. If you go on to become an engineer, an accountant, an actuary, a numbers person, 
That lesson is reinforced over and over again. If you do things right, you get the right answer. If you got the wrong answer, you must have done something wrong. And then of course, you come into this class. You're going to, you're going to have to value a company as part of this class, right? Now, I can tell you what's going to happen in this class because I've seen it happen in the 32 years I've taught this class every single semester. Around the 10th, 11th week of this class, about 20 of you in this class are going to show up in my office. Not all at the same time. My office is pretty small. You're going to put a valuation down on my desk and you say, can you take a look at it and tell me whether I got the right answer? Incidentally, most of the 20 people who will show up will be engineers, accountants, actuaries, numbers people. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do when you give me that valuation and ask me, did I get the right answer? I'm going to push the valuation across the desk. And I'm going to tell you what I've told every single group that's done this in the previous 32 years. I don't know what the right answer is. And your faith in the system is going to crack. You're going to say, going to say look, you're teaching this class. You don't know what the right value for my company is? Well, think about it. If I knew what the right value for every company was, why would I be teaching this class? And at that stage in the process, you'll see the group splinter because I've seen it happen every single semester. One half cannot deal with the fact that there's no right answer. You know what happens to them? They become fixed income people. You know what? It's so much more comfortable sitting there with a the bond. The maturity is given, the coupon is given. You have to worry about default risk, but that's all you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about growth and margins and survival. The other half says, this is kind of neat. If you don't know what the right answer is, I can never ever conclusively be wrong. Think about it. You can never ever conclusively be wrong. You value a company. You tell me to buy it. It goes down 30 years in a row. You know what you tell me? Not a long enough time horizon. It goes bankrupt. You know what you tell me? The system got in the way. I think it's great that there is no right answer but it does make for a lot of discomfort. So I'm setting you up for the fact that once you finish valuing a company, you're going to look for affirmation. Did I get the right answer? And I'm going to save you the trouble of saying, nobody knows what the right answer is. You've got to be comfortable not knowing. And I'll add a proposition to this. Not all companies are equally difficult or equally easy to value. Let me give you a contrast. Let's say this half of the class values Coca-Cola and this half values Twitter. You go to work, you finish your valuations. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think would have, is going to come back with the more precise valuation? The Coca-Cola people or the Twitter people? Think about it. The people valuing Coca-Cola are going to come back with a more precise valuation. You know why? The company's been around a long time. We know exactly what it sells. We have history. We have, we, we have lots of data. We have projections we can make. There is a lot of basis for valuing Coca-Cola the valuation is going to be more precise. Twitter, we don't even know what business it's in. Maybe advertising, maybe something else. Will it be around? Will it not be around? A lot of uncertainty about the future and the valuation is going to reflect it. So if I judge valuations based on precision alone, the Coca-Cola valuation is going to be better than the Twitter valuation. But let me ask you a follow-up question. In which of these two companies is the payoff to doing valuation going to be greater? Think about it. The reason the Coca-Cola valuation was easier to do is because you knew what the company did and you had lots of history, right? Are you the only person who had those advantages? Every other person in the market looking at Coca-Cola has exactly those advantages. So the same reasons that allowed you to come up with a precise valuation of Coca-Cola will let them come up with the precise valuation. The differential, the potential advantage you bring to the table is far smaller with Coca-Cola than with Twitter. Because you know what most people do Twitter? Because of the uncertainty, they won't even try to value the company. The payoff to doing valuation is greatest when you feel most uncertain about your numbers. I know I've asked you to pick a company and I know some of you will come to me to try to, to, uh, to, try to ask me, did I pick a good company? And I'm going to save you the trouble. There are no good or bad companies, but if you really want to see a payoff to your valuation, to learn about valuation, go where it's darkest. Value a nice Ukrainian mining company or a Venezuelan consumer product company. You know what I'm talking about, right? The uncertainty will be daunting, but the payoff to doing valuation is greatest wherever it's darkest. Which brings me to my third and final misconception about valuation. 
If I make my model bigger, it's going to get better. Over the last 30 years, the amount of data we have available to value companies has exploded and our access to sophisticated models has improved. It's so much easier building a big model now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And if you have a team in your basement building models for you, God help you because I call this the geek squad. You hire them for their spreadsheet capacities. You send them into the basement. Why? Because I don't think they can see the light of day. I think they become vampires. And they love building models. And the way I describe these models is inputs come in, but they never leave. The model starts with 12 inputs, goes to 15, 20, 25, 30. And before you know it, you need 85 inputs to value one company. And then they send that model up to your desk saying, from this day on when you value companies, I want you to use this model. Two things happen to these models. The first is what I call input fatigue. You know what input fatigue is? I'll describe it and you can tell me whether you've ever felt it. Maybe, you know, during a, when you were on a, when you were working or when you, you know, or, or when you were in an internship. It usually hits you on a Saturday night around 1030. You think you're done for the week. You get ready to shut down your computer and go home. And your boss shows up. He throws an annual report. Throws. Doesn't give it to you. Throws an annual report in your desk. Says, I want this company valued first thing tomorrow morning. Why? It's Sunday morning. It's his trial by fire. He wants to see how much you really want this job. Now, part of you wants to exercise your option to abandon. Now, I won't describe this option, but it's a deeply satisfying one to exercise. It usually takes the form of picking up the annual report and throwing it back in your boss's face saying, hey, you do it yourself. That's a deeply satisfying moment when it leaves your hand. But after that come deeply dissatisfying moments. When you get fired, you lose your job, you're not able to pay your rent. You think about it for a moment, but then you remember all the payments you got to make and you start valuing the company with your in-house model with 85 inputs. You go input by input carefully. You get to the 12th input, the clock strikes midnight. You're not Cinderella. You wish you were. You look down, your stomach drops. There are 73 more inputs to go. You look at the 13th input, it says, what was the inventory five years ago? Part of you wants to go look it up, but that part's too exhausted to get out of the, out of the chair. The other part says, hey, make up a number, let's move on. So you enter a random number. It's amazing how quickly the random numbers roll out. And the scary thing is when the output comes out, it all looks the same. The input you spent hours going over and the input you just made up in the spur of the moment. They all swim together. And here's another little secret in valuation. If you're doing a lot of evaluation with a lot of random number inputs, you know what the best way to hide that fact is? Create more detail in your output. Have 500 line items. You drown the good stuff with the bad stuff. Nobody will know what's systematic and what's random. In fact, whenever I'm given a valuation, what the first thing I do is I weigh it. If it weighs 20 pounds and it's 500 pages, my first question to you is, what are you trying to hide from me? Input fatigue. The second thing that happens is the model becomes a black box. I'm not sure who's running you, who. Are you running the model or is the model running you? Have you thought about that? At some point, the power shifts where the model starts running you. It starts saying, get me that input. You, you scurry and you get the input. It says, get me a cup of coffee. You run out and get a cup of coffee. In fact, I'll tell you a story to show you how models sometimes take over the process. So about 25 years ago, I saw an equity research report from a JP Morgan analyst. The buy recommendation on it with the target price of $85. The stock was trading at 35 and I was a little surprised how high the target price was. So I called the analyst who I knew and I said, hey, how do you come up with this target price? Why is it so high? And he said, I didn't do it. I said, what do you mean you didn't do it? Your name's on the report, the company name's there. He said, I didn't do it. I said, who did it? He said, Value Mac did it. I said, who the hell is Value Mac? He said, that's our in-house valuation model. I said, what did it do? Value the company while you were away and leave the valuation in your desk? But what he was trying to say is, look, this is a very complicated model. I feed numbers into the model. Something happens inside the model and $85 pops out on the other side. We live in a world where it's easy to build complex models. But I have a piece of advice for you. 
Sometimes you can mangle simple assets using complex models. Less is more. In the physical science, there's a principle called the principle of parsimony, where basically you start with the simplest explanation for a phenomenon before you make yourself Einstein. If you're asked to value a simple asset, use a simple model. If you can value an asset with three inputs, don't go with five. If you can value a company with two years of forecast, don't do 10. You're asking for trouble. And I'll give you one example of a really simple asset that in my view gets mangled with complex models. It's cash. Every company has cash on its balance sheet, right? And you won't believe this, but every week I get at least a half a dozen emails from people who claim to have built a better model to value cash. And here's how the emails will go. Professor Deodorant. Well, that's what Microsoft Word does to my name with spell check. Well, at least I smell good. I've spent the last six months of my life building this model to value cash, to which my response is, what an empty life you must have. But I keep reading. Can you take a look at the attached Excel spreadsheet and tell me whether I've built a good model? And at the bottom of the email will be an attachment, cashvaluation.xls. I'm not opening an attachment for somebody I don't know, but I've actually programmed the F7 key on my laptop to respond to these emails. And here's what it says. Have you tried counting it? It works with cash, 20, 40, 60. You don't need a model to value cash because here's what happens when you build a model to value cash. Let's take an example. Let's say you take Google, which has ca a cash balance of roughly 100 billion. If you see a cash balance on a company like Google's balance sheet, you know where it's invested, right? It's invested in commercial paper and tables, something riskless or close to riskless and liquid. Let me ask you a question. What do you think that 100 billion in cash is earning Google right now? If you're lucky, maybe 2%. So let's make some projections. You project out the income from the cash at 2%. And this is where all is lost because then the Pavlovian response kicks in. He's saying, what Pavlovian response? The one you spend tens of thousands of dollars in business school to acquire, which means if you forecast things, you need to discount them. And to discount them, what do you need? A discount rate. And this is when you pull out your corporate finance and evaluation book and you find that chapter on cost of capital. You plug in betas and risk premiums and risk free rates and default spreads and you come up with a 10% cost of capital of Google. You pat yourself on the back saying, well, this is why I went to business school. And you discount the income from cash using that discount rate. Let's see where you are. You have 100 billion in cash invested close to risklessly earning 2%. You project the income out and then you discount that income at a 10% cost of capital, what do you think is going to happen to the 100 billion cash? It's going to probably become 80 billion or 75 billion. Well, you just wiped out 20 billion in cash by just discounting at a high discount rate. The cash is still there, but by discounting at the wrong discount rate, you've just reduced the value of that cash. You say, that would never happen to me. It happens all the time. I'll give you a simple way in which it slips in. If you estimate cash flows for a company starting with net income, remember, remember that net income includes the income from operating assets as well as the net income from cash. And you discount that cash flow you got at the cost of equity. You've just done what I described. Don't go looking for trouble. If you're given a simple asset, use a simple model. One of the things I'm going to talk about is building in complexity when you need it, but no more. When you're faced with the question of, should I have more detail in my valuation? Always ask the question, am I adding something to the valuation with that detail? So at the rest of this class, for instance, I'll give you an example of where this is going to show up. When I do cash flows or when anybody does cash flows to get to cash flows, you need change in working capital as one of your items. Now, I've seen people break working capital down into its components, inventory, accounts received. I've never done that in evaluation. You're saying, why not? Because I'm incapable of forecasting days receivable for the next 30 years. If you have the power to do it, all the more power to you, build it in. But since I don't have the capacity to forecast the individual components, why break things down into detail? Less is more. So now let's talk about what I, these three things coming together. I call this my Bermuda Triangle evaluation. If you remember the le legend of the Bermuda Triangle, it's where, where ships disappeared in the, on the, in the Atlantic Ocean. There's magical zone in the Atlantic. Well, the Bermuda Triangle evaluation is where good sense disappears. 
And what causes the Bermuda Triangle of, of valuation is the other three components I talked about. The first is bias, the second is uncertainty, the third is complexity. And finding, if you get tangled up in one or all three of these, you will find your good sense disappearing. So keep that Bermuda Triangle in mind as we go through this class. Now let me set the table for what the rest of this class is going to be about. There are three and only three ways you can attach a number to an asset. The first is what's called intrinsic valuation. Sounds fancy, but we value an asset or a business based on its capacity to generate cash flows. We will talk a lot about intrinsic valuation and use discounted cash flow valuation as a tool to estimate intrinsic value. So in intrinsic value, the value of an asset comes from its own characteristics. So that's the first way to attach a number is with intrinsic valuation. The second is what I'm going to call relative valuation, but I'd rather call it pricing. Because here's how you attach a number to an asset with relative valuation of pricing. You look for other assets out there that are already priced, and then you try to price your assets based on how other assets are priced. Example that comes to mind is when you buy a house, think of how the realtor comes up with a number for the house. He or she doesn't do an intrinsic valuation. They look at other houses in the neighborhood, look at what they sold for, and attach a price to your house. You say, that's houses, not for stocks. Well, we use a PE ratio to price a stock. You don't value the stock. Guess what you do? You look at other stocks that you call similar to mine. You look at what PE ratio those stocks trade at, and you attach a pricing to the stock. So the second approach to attaching a number to your asset is pricing, looking at similar assets out there. There's a third approach to valuation. And this is applied when you have assets which have contingent cash flows. Something has to happen for those cash flows to show up. So as an example, I would take a patent, a non-viable patent, but if things work out, that patent could become viable and have cash flows. In that case, in that case alone, you might be able to use option pricing models. Intrinsic valuation, pricing, or option pricing. Everything in valuation has to fall into one of these three buckets. And we're going to spend the rest of this class talking about all three. But I'm going to, in this session at least, give you a very quick introduction into what each approach tries to do and the pluses and minuses of each one, at least as a setup. Now, in doing all of this, when you do valuation, there's something to keep in mind. I don't know about you, but I don't value companies because I'm intellectually curious. I don't lie awake at night wondering, hey, I wonder what Facebook is worth right now. We value companies for pragmatic reasons because we want to act on those valuations. And if you're valuing a company, a publicly traded company, you're already implicitly making the assumption that markets make mistakes and that you can find those mistakes. So implicit in each of these valuation approaches is an assumption about how markets make mistakes. And one of the things I talk about, I'd like to talk about as I talk about each approach is, hey, what are we assuming about markets when we use this approach? So let's start with intrinsic valuation or its most common form, discounted cash flow valuation. What is it? Well, in discounted cash flow valuation, the value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows in the asset. Hey, that's like a very first class in finance, right? Remember that class where I asked you to buy a financial calculator about three weeks before the class, then you show up in class and you don't like the class, you decide to drop it, but you can't return the calculator? Well, if nothing else, you've learned a very important lesson about sunk costs, but it's amazing how much of finance is present value and discounted cash flow valuation is an extension of that concept. Philosophically, you're assuming that every asset has an intrinsic value and that you can estimate it. Why is this an assumption? Because we can't prove that. I call this, I mean, it's very much like the search for the Holy Grail. Remember for 2000 years, people have been looking for the Holy Grail, they never found it, but it doesn't stop them from looking. Intrinsic valuation is very much the same. You'll never get to see it, but you keep hope alive. And if you look at the ingredients in a discounted cash flow model, they're pretty much always, always the same. There are three ingredients, there are cash flows, there's a discount rate and there's a life for an asset. You give me those three ingredients, I can value just about any asset. And finally, let's think about the market mistake that you need to exploit in discounted cash flow valuation. You have to start off by assuming that markets make mistakes. That's an easy assumption. Even the firmest believer in efficient markets will go along with you on that one. Second, you got to assume that with your intrinsic valuation or DCF valuations, you can find those mistakes. 
let's give the mistake a name. Let's say you're looking at Cisco. It's trading at 45. You do an intrinsic valuation. You come up at 60. Let's say you're right. You found a market mistake. The value is really 60. The stock's trading at 45. So you go buy a thousand shares at 45. Have you made any money yet? In fact, here comes the third assumption. To make money on your mistakes, the market has to correct its mistakes. So let's list them out. Market has to make mistakes. You've got to find the mistake. The market has to correct these mistakes. Well, guess, guess which one of these is not under your control? The last one. You can be right on a discounted cash flow basis and go bankrupt being right. You can pick stocks based on astrological signs and make millions. There's no justice in this world. And if that bothers you, let it go because it's part of investing. So let's take a closer look at the advantages and disadvantages of discounted cash flow valuation. Now, I'm a believer in discounted cash flow valuation, but I come in with open eyes. Here are the good things about discounted cash flow valuation. Because you're valuing an asset based on its characteristics, you're less exposed. You're never completely unexposed. You're less exposed to market moods and perceptions. Second, to truly value a company, you've got to understand the company. You can, and in intrinsic, in discounted cash flow valuation, if you do it right, you have to grapple with what the company does. And if you buy into the old Buffett saying that you buy businesses, not stocks, discounted cash flow valuation seems to be the tool you should use in investing. And finally, if you buy into the notion that ultimately you can collect the cash flows, then you don't care what the market price is. It's very tough to get there. But you're, in a sense, less worried about market movements because you collect the cash flows every year. You're making a decent return. So that's the pluses of discounted cash flow valuation. But as I said, I come in with open eyes. I understand the limitations of discounted cash flow valuation. The first is it requires more work, more information, more inputs than pricing. Up front, I admit it. And I'll talk about how important to tell a story about a company. You need to understand the company. Second, as you will see with this kind of cash flow valuation, just because you have cash flows and discount rates doesn't mean you're not being biased. I told you about my valuations of Microsoft, how bias found its way. And of course, you're going to have to deal with uncertainty. Bias and uncertainty are always a given. We'll have to talk about how to deal with them well, because if you deal with them badly, your discounted cash flow valuations are going to suffer. And finally, Here's a catch. When you do an intrinsic valuation of a company and you value company after company, it is conceivable that every company in a sector or even an entire market is overvalued. It can happen. And if so, what should you do? Not buy any stocks, right? Now, if you're a portfolio manager or a mutual fund manager whose job it is to buy stocks, do you see why intrinsic valuation might not work for you? The nature of intrinsic valuation is you're often a contrarian and you have to control your destiny in ways that you might not. So I understand why many portfolio managers might take a look at DCF valuation and say, it's not for me. So let's talk a little bit about when discounted cash flow valuation works best. Well, obviously, to do discounted cash flow valuation, you need to have expected cash flows. So you can do discounted cash flow valuation only on assets that have expected cash flows. You're saying, that is so stupid. Of course, that's true. In a sense, it's a very powerful proposition because it tells you that when you have an asset that has no cash flows, you cannot value that asset. There is no intrinsic value for gold or Bitcoin because those are not assets, they're currencies. Currencies cannot be valued. I'll come back and fill in the details later in the class, but discounted cash flow valuation can be used only on assets with cash flows. And if you think about what kinds of investors are best suited for using discounted cash flow valuation, first, remember, you need markets to correct their mistakes, right? Well, I'll improve the odds for you. Even though you might not control whether markets correct their mistakes, the longer your time horizon, assuming you were right in the first place, the greater the chance the market will correct its mistakes. So you need a long time horizon. Second, it's nice if you can provide the catalyst for markets to correct their mistakes. It's an advantage that a Carl Icahn or a Bill Ackman has over you or I. I buy an undervalued stock. 
I don't have a forum to convince others to go along, but if Carl I can buys an undervalued stock, he can get on CNBC and just bought the stock and make the price move. It's nice if you can be a catalyst, which is one reason an activist investor might have an advantage over a passive investor. And finally, because you're not, if you're in an, a because markets move around you, discounted cash flow valuation works best for investors who are not affected by market moves. And that's easier said than done. People who constantly check their phone to see what the market is doing in the last 15 minutes are not good candidates for discounted cash flow valuation. So while I'm a believer in DCF valuation, I understand why it might not be right for you and why you might disagree with me. So let's move on to the second way you can attach a number to a company. You can do a pricing. As I said, in pricing, you try to put a number on an asset based on what similar assets are being priced at. Implicitly it's saying, I don't know whether there's an intrinsic value, whether it exists or whether I can estimate it. So I'm gonna price things and I'm gonna make money by buying things at a low price and selling at a high price. You know what the difference between an investor and a trader is? An investor values companies and tries to pick companies with the prices less than the value, buy those stocks. A trader buys at a low price and sells at a high price. He plays the pricing game. It's a much cleaner, much more, much easier game to understand. And to price an asset, here's what you need. You need either an identical asset, which is almost impossible to find, or similar assets. Second, you need those assets to be priced and you need to be able to standardize the price. In what sense? If this were real estate, I can't compare the price of one building to another because one building might be small and the other building might be large. I might look at price per square foot. With stocks, you know where this shows up? Whenever you use a multiple, price earnings ratio, EV to EBITDA, you're looking at a standardized price. And why do you need a standardized price? Because the per share price is in a sense arbitrary. If I do a two for one stock split, my price drops by roughly 50%. And finally, if the, if the, if the assets I'm comparing my asset to are not, com, not completely identical, I need to be able to control for differences. So basically in pricing, I need to find other assets that are being priced out there and control for differences. And finally, what kind of market mistake am I assuming when I am a trader? I'm assuming markets get prices wrong in the short term and they correct it. That, and implicitly, you can already see that if you have a shorter time horizon, the pricing game might be the better game for you. There's a greater chance a stock, a com market will notice that a stock is trading at six times earnings in a, mar in a market where every other company similar to it is trading at 10 times earnings and correct that mistake than it is for that same market to correct a valuation mistake. So we're assuming a mistake here as well, but a different kind of mistake. So what are the advantages of pricing? First, you're much more in sync with the market. You're saying, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, it might actually be more in line with what your job is. If your job is to be invested in equities no matter what, well, your game is a pricing game. You have to find the least undervalued or the, the most undervalued stock or the least overvalued stocks at any point in time. So if your job is a pricing game, if you are a banker trying to pri you know, put a number on an IPO, if you're a acquirer trying to decide what to pay for a target, you're playing the pricing game and pricing might be the right tool for you. Second, if you're judged against other portfolio managers, you're judged on a relative basis, you can see why pricing makes sense for you, right? Because you're not being judged on whether you picked undervalued companies, you're being judged on, are you picking less overpriced stocks than everybody else? So if you're judged on a relative basis, you can see why pricing makes more sense for you. Pricing does require less information, at least on the surface, than discounted cash flow valuation. I can attach a pricing to a stock with five minutes, right? In five minutes, I can pull up stocks, that are like it in the same sector, look at the PE ratio, slap the PE ratio on my stock, I'm done. And finally, you are playing and pricing what I call the incremental game, which means that you make money if the price goes up. So if you buy a stock just before an earnings report and you guessed right on what that earnings report contained as news, you could make money in 15 minutes. It's an incremental game. What are the disadvantages? Well, think about the ad advantages and flip them on their head. When you tell me that a stock is underpriced and you buy it, remember your underpriced stock might still be overvalued relative to its cash flows. So you buy the cheapest online advertising stock or social media company. You might be right in your assessment of it being the cheapest, but they might all be overvalued. 
So you could have a portfolio that looks cheap on a pricing basis, but if all stocks in a market or sector are overvalued, when the correction hits, you're going to feel it. And on the surface, it's true, pricing requires less information than intrinsic valuation, but only on the surface. If you dig a little deeper, you're going to discover that the assumptions you are running away from on cash flows, growth, and risk that you had to make in discounted cash flow valuation, you're making in pricing. You're just making them implicitly rather than explicitly. In what sense? When you apply a price earnings ratio of 25 to a stock, are you making implicit assumptions about future growth? Absolutely. In fact, the danger in pricing is you might not even realize the assumptions you're making about growth and risk when you slap that 25 times earnings. So your assumptions are often implicit. So when will pricing work best? Well, first, pricing works best for assets where you have lots of similar assets. The reason StubHub works so well is because to get a ticket in Yankee Stadium, all I need to do, do is find other seats in the same section that are being sold, and that's easy to do. So the larger the number of similar assets that are priced out there, the easier it is to price an asset. So it's easier to price a Yankee ticket than it is to price a Picasso. You see why? There aren't hundreds of Picassos that are being traded every day. And there has to be some common variable that you can control for. With the Yankee seats, what is that? The section. Obviously, I'd pay more for field level seats than those sky high up in the ceiling seats. So you have to control for differences. And pricing tends to work best for investors who have shorter time horizons, who have to be judged against other investors. So they judge on a relative basis and it works best for investors who might be able to take of pricing mistakes in both directions. If you're a hedge fund, you can see why pricing might be a gain. Because if you buy underpriced stocks and you sell overpriced stocks, and if you're right in your judgment on pricing, even if the market collapses, you're going to make money because you make money on the correction towards the right number. So pricing might work best for those people who can take advantage of pricing mistakes in both directions. Now, one of the detours we're going to take after we talk about intrinsic valuation and pricing is we're going to talk about asset-based valuation. What is that? Rather than value an entire business, we might value the individual assets or pieces of the business. In fact, I'm going to even value social media and advertising companies based on number of users, number of subscribers. In asset-based or user-based valuation, you're starting at the bottom and building up. So the uses where you will see, the, the places you will see this is first in liquidation valuation. You have to sell off individual assets and you need a number for them. You'll see it in accounting valuation. We're often asked to put a number on a particular division, on a particular part of a company, brand name, for instance, customer list. And finally, if you're an activist investor, this might be useful if you're thinking about breaking up a company into its pieces and selling off the pieces. So when you talk about valuing a division, a business, an asset, a user, again, you can either do intrinsic valuation of that business or pricing. And it's easiest to do when you have separable assets. So in other words, if you're a real estate company with eight real estate holdings, I can value each holding separately. But if you're Disney, this might be more difficult to do because how do I separate the theme park from the movies? Because so many of your movie characters are walk-ons in the theme park. So the more interlinked your assets are, the more difficult it is to do asset-based valuation. So in this class, we will talk about valuing what I call octopus companies, multi-business, multinational companies from the bottom up. And it's a useful detour because it talks about how, it basically gives you a sense of how flexible valuation is. You can apply it at any level building from the bottom up or the top down. So once I've done intrinsic valuation and pricing, I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to start off this question right now and I'll come back and ask you that question after you've had a chance to value and price your companies. Given this very short introduction that I've given of intrinsic valuation as being a value attached to a company based on its cash flows, growth and risk and pricing as the number you attach to a company based on similar assets and how or similar companies and how they're priced. If I asked you to pick an approach what do you, and I gave you a sense of what you need with each approach, right, to succeed. Long time horizon, short time horizon. Now, I'd like, I'd like you to think about which approach might appeals to you most. And there are no right answers. So don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at me. Just, you know, are you, if you had to pick, would you pick intrinsic valuation? Would you pick pricing? Are you starting off? And again, this is perfectly okay with the perception that, hey, markets, market mistakes are very tough to find that this is an exercise we'd like to know this, the tools of valuation and pricing, but you're actually not going to use it to pick stocks. 
I'll give you a minute to think about it because as I said, I'm going to ask you the same question at the end of this class to see if your answer has changed. So pick the answer, set this page to the side. Which brings me to the third and final approach to putting a number on a company. There's very little in valuation in this class that I would claim is new and different. Much of what we do has been around for a long time. The only part of valuation which is new and different is applying option pricing techniques to value certain kinds of assets. And if you think about it, here's what makes an option an option. First is they're derivative assets. They derive their value from something else, an underlying asset. The payoff is contingent on something happening. In a call option, the price has to be greater than the strike price. In a put option, it's got to be less than the put price. And usually options are fixed length. So if I am looking at an asset which has these characteristics, in a sense, I have an option, right? I should be using an option pricing model. In fact, the best way to characterize options is with payoff diagrams because options are fairly unique payoff diagrams. And what makes them unique is that kink in the payoff diagram on the strike price. If you have a call option, if the stock price is less than strike price, you lose a fixed amount, but the amount is, is guaranteed. That, that's the most you can lose but the upside is unlimited. If you have a put option, if the stock price is greater than the strike price, you lose that fixed amount. But again, you have potentially very large profits if the stock price drops below the strike price. When I introduce this into my valuation, this is what I'm gonna look for. An asset as a payoff diagram, which looks like a call option. I should be using a call option model to value it. Now, there are obviously direct examples of options, listed options of CBO, you have warrants, you have contingent value rights, you have leaps, which are long-term options. I'm not gonna value any of those in my class. Why? Because they eat this basic option. You get that in option pricing class. Saying, why then bring it up? Because there are examples in valuation where I think option pricing can help you attach a better number to an asset. The first is when you're asked to value equity in a deeply troubled company. Deeply troubled, let me be very specific. This is a company that's losing a lot of money and has a lot of debt. If you're losing a lot of money, you have a lot of debt. The sword's hanging over you, right? You could go bankrupt. I'm gonna argue that equity in a deeply troubled firm, described the way I described it, negative earnings, a lot of debt, has the characteristics of an option. That maybe a discounted cash flow model is not the right model to use if you have equity in a deeply troubled firm. If you have a natural resource company, you have know, undeveloped reserves, an oil company with undeveloped oil reserves, you have an option, right? Those undeveloped reserves. Option in what sense? Well, if oil prices go to $80 a barrel, you might get a lot of oil out of the ground and sell it. But if they go to $30 a barrel, those reserves might not be viable. You might not take it up. So the undeveloped reserves have the characteristics of an option. If you're a biotech or a pharma company, which has an option, a patent to produce a new drug, that drug, that patent might not be viable right now, but the fact that you have the patent gives you an option, an option to produce a drug if things change, the technology changes, the market changes. And finally, if you have a company with exclusive rights, license, uh, an exclusive right to do something, you have an option. So we're gonna use option pricing, and these are called real options to come up with values for companies. Now the advantage of using option pricing models, they're going to let us put numbers on companies that they otherwise would throw up our hands on. Equity in deeply troubled companies, for instance, traditional DCF models often tell you the equity is worth nothing. You can't really price these companies because they're losing money on every single dimension. EBIT die, EBIT net income. You can't do a PE ratio. Their book values might be negative, but you might be able to use an option pricing model to attach numbers to companies. So companies you'd have given up on, you might be able to put a number. But the bigger payoff from talking about these real options are the implications that come out of it. One of the things that sets options apart from every other asset is when you talk about risk with every in the context of every other asset, risk, higher risk is usually a bad thing. In discounted cash flow valuation, when you have more risk, you have a higher discount rate of a lower value. In pricing, if you have more risk, you usually trade a lower multiple of earnings, you punish the company. But in options, risk becomes your ally. And here's why. Remember those payoff diagrams? Think about how risk works. You have downside risk and upside risk. Which risk are you worried about? Which, how many of you are more worried about upside than downside risk? Hey, you're a strange person if you do, right? Because it's downside risk we worry about. And guess what? In option pricing models, I limit your downside risk. Remember in the payoff diagram, you have limited losses. And because of that, risk becomes your ally. So when you're buying equity in a deeply troubled firm, you want risk as your ally. You want to buy equity in a deeply troubled, risky company, not a deeply troubled, safe company. I don't even know what a deeply troubled, safe company would look like. 
So risk becomes your ally. So it is useful to bring in options if nothing else to think about what those implications are. What are the disadvantages? Well, option pricing models were designed for short-term listed options, three-month, six-month options. And when we use them to value real options, we're really stretching these models to long time horizons. The underlying asset might not be traded. It's messy. We could get a number, but that number might not be actionable. You might not be able to monetize it. Second, to the extent that you need the value of the underlying asset, Real options are not an alternative to intrinsic valuation. They're an add-on. In other words, to value equity in a deeply troubled company, I actually have to do a discounted cash flow valuation first to the company before doing the real option. So this is not an alternative. It's an add-on. And third, you have to be careful not to double count. Let me explain what I mean by this. I've seen equity research analysts value pharmaceutical companies, do a discounted cash flow valuation. And then after they've done the discounted cash flow valuation, add on a value because these companies are valuable patents. You're saying, what's wrong with that? We just talked about doing that. Well, if in your discounted cash flow valuation, you also projected a high growth rate because you thought these patents would be converted into products and you add the value of patents on top of them, you've double counted. So we're going to talk about how you can avoid that double counting. But I think it's a useful tool to have in your arsenal. So in summary, there are hundreds and hundreds of valuation models out there, but they fall into one of these three buckets. Intrinsic valuation, pricing or relative valuation, contingent claim valuation. They can yield different estimates or different numbers for the same company at the same point in time. And that is going to create a problem for you. And here's why. If you look at your project description, you're asked to value your company, then price your company, and perhaps come up with a real option value for your company. At the end of the process, you know what I ask you to do? I ask you to give me a recommendation. Would you buy the stock or sell it? Let's play this out. Let's suppose your intrinsic valuation tells you your company is overvalued, and your pricing tells you it's underpriced. It's, it can happen. There are different ways of thinking about attaching a number. You have to decide which one you're going to hang your hat on. And I'm not going to pre-decide for you. And that's why I asked you, given what you've learned about these approaches, and you will continue to learn about them, which approach you're most comfortable with. You have to find out what you're comfortable with and work with that. It's not my gospel to spread as this is the right way to do things. It is something you've got to figure out. So that is basically my big picture perspective. And starting with the next session, we're going to dive into the details. But I thought it would be good to set the table first before we started talking about discount rates and cash flows and growth rates and intrinsic valuation of PE ratios and EV to EBITDA multiples and pricing. So I hope this session has given you that perspective.